Okay. So this is the presentation for your summer camp, and this is Animal Fun. We're doing session number two, and that is cool animal jobs. And these are all just focusing on things that animals do for us. Um, and there are things that animals just do naturally to help us out, like cats can help with rat populations and things like that. But what I wanted to focus on are like, what are the cool things that like, like we're gonna talk about Croatian bomb bees, bees that like can detect explosive devices. We're gonna talk about dolphins that help stranded swimmers. These are animals that go above and beyond because of human training uh, to help uh, humans or nature. And my next slide, here we go. Maybe, and go and go <laughs> here we go so like if you think about dogs actually why don't we mute ourselves here i'm gonna go ahead and i'm gonna start just talking about dogs because that's my favorite animal and how they help us um so let's go and see how dogs can help us but first we're gonna look um, there we go i'm gonna have you guys mute yourselves here just because it is being recorded and i don't want you guys to end up on the internet <laughs> Um, but we're going to talk about how humans use animals, right? So we use animals in science, like to help us like make medicine. We use them in, in medicine itself. So we're going to talk about dogs who are going to help us fight COVID-19 so we can all hopefully get out of our houses. Uh, uh, animals are often used in the military and in law. This is a dog that, the picture here is of a dog that works in a courthouse. Um, he's a therapy dog and what he does is if people are going into court and they're really upset, he goes and he helps them feel better. Um, and that ties in with comfort. You guys might have seen some dogs in your schools or at the library, either helping kids learn how to read. Um, our dog, Captain, helped our daughter, Ace, learn how to read because like she felt more comfortable reading to him than she did reading to other people. So it helped her get more confidence in reading. Um, environmental preservation and much more. So why should we use animals in this kind of work? Um, so animals have superpowers. I like to think of it like that, right? So in the case of, um, of dogs, they have super powerful noses that we're gonna talk about in just a second. Um, some of these dogs can help find cancer in people. They can find bed bugs. They can find uh, landmines or explosives as we were discussing earlier. Um, animals, we use them for their adorableness, right? So like comfort animals who help in schools and emotional support animals, if that's a phrase that you've heard before, we're gonna talk about what those animals are. Um, and in education, so um, one of the district principals of Somerville has reached out to me about trying to find a, a permanent therapy dog for our school, which would be really cool. Um, and in part because they're cute, but in part because like, kids feel better talking to animals than they do sometimes to big people because we can be scary. Um, and they ha also have these other superpowers like their noses and whales and dolphins can swim so they can help underwater, birds can fly and help in the sky. So here's an example, um, dog noses, right? So they can smell 13 parts per trillion and that seems like a lot of really big numbers, right? So that's like three drops of water in four Olympic sized swimming pools. That's a whole lot too, right? So that might be a big concept to digest. So let's think of it this way. You know how like when you walk into your house and your parents are maybe baking cookies or brownies or bread, so we can smell that they're making a food. But when your dog walks in, they can smell every single ingredient that is in those cookies. So they can tell you, oh, that's a quarter of a teaspoon of baking soda, if they knew what baking soda was. Um, they can also smell 40 feet under your feet. So let's think of it that way. Um, a basketball hoop, right? So if you guys are playing basketball, that basketball net is 10 feet up in the air. So four basketball nets below your feet, they can smell straight down under the surface of the earth. Um, we can't do that. And in part, because we don't have um, as many scent receptors, uh, dogs have way more scent receptors in their nose that tell their brain, hey, there's a smell here. Um, but they also have this magic superpower that we don't have, and it's called their vomero nasal organ. And that's just a fancy way of saying, um, a, it's a shortcut 
So if you see here on this dog, you see this little bump under his teeth here? Um, it's behind his front teeth. Now, if you put your finger at the hair, right? We don't have a little bump. We don't have anything back there, but dogs do and cats do and most mammals do and snakes and reptiles do. You know when snakes stick out their tongue and they suck it back in and they're tasting the air? That is an animal using its vomeronasal organ. And it's a little shortcut. So like they taste the air here and they push those scent receptors up into their nasal cavity. So they basically have a way of getting more information around scent than we ever could. So for us, it's vestigial. And vestigial is a fancy word of saying, we don't need it anymore, so we don't have it. And we have another vestigial organ. It's right here, and it's called your appendix. Um, so if any of you guys have ever heard of an appendix, um, that is an organ that we have, but we don't use in a traditional way. Um, and the same with our vomeronasal organ. While humans have gone on to develop better vision um, and a bigger brain, we lost that our sense of smell and our ability to detect uh, things through our nasal organ. So let's talk about some things that animals can do for us using their superpower. And again, I am going to be talking a lot about dogs because that's my job. But I reached out to some really cool scientists on Twitter and researchers on Twitter, and they really stepped up to help you guys understand some cool things that animals did. And I learned a lot today. Um, over the last weekend putting this together for you guys. So I'm really excited to talk about some of these dogs, especially this one. Her name is Daisy. Now, if you guys um, have heard of dogs that might be able to detect illnesses, like maybe an oncoming seizure or uh, blood, um, blood sugar dropping dogs who help people who might have diabetes, this dog can detect cancer and she has since passed on. She she's no longer with us, but her name was Daisy and she detected over 500 cases of cancer in people, including in her own owner, which was really remarkable. Um, and the way she did it, they trained her to smell cancer on breath, on skin, and in urine. So you would pee in a cup and say, here, Daisy. Um, but they wouldn't just give her the whole cup. They would put it in, you can see here, she's got like a little glass. They would drop the odor in there and then she would sniff out different stations. And if she alerted, I think she had an, uh, a passive alert. We're gonna talk about those in a minute. She would sit next to the odor and say, it's here, I found cancer. And then she would either get a cookie or a toy or whatever her favorite thing was. So she has helped a lot of people. Um, Next, we have the COVID-19 dogs. Now, the reason we're doing summer camp online is because of this disease, COVID-19. And I'm sure you guys have heard about it. Maybe your parents are talking about it. Maybe you've seen it in the news, but it's a, it's a bad disease and we're still learning a lot about it. But most diseases have an odor. And because of those 13 uh, parts per trillion, these dogs can smell it. And so these dogs worked, let me see if I can read my notes here. Um, so while Daisy, the cancer detection dog, was able to find cancer in breath and urine and sweat, other medical detection dogs like these guys have been able to find malaria and Parkinson's disease, which are two horrible illnesses. Um, but these dogs worked with a charity um, and have been earmarked for training. So Norman, Digby, Storm, Star, Jasper, and Asher, um, said, um, and the charity said that their noses should be able to detect coronavirus in as little as six to eight weeks. So they should be able to be trained and detected. What they're planning on doing is taking these dogs to sweep through places like school or an airport and alert and say, I think this person might have COVID and then that person can go on for further testing so they can catch it early before it can spread, which would be a real good help for humans. Um, and then we have animals who find danger. And this is where we start to divert from dogs. But first we do have to talk about explosive detection dogs. Have you guys ever been in an airport um, and you've seen dogs checking luggage or suitcases? Some of those dogs are looking for contraband or, or fruit or plants that we shouldn't be bringing into the country. Other places um, might have dogs who are looking for explosive detection, uh, for explosives, things that could hurt people. Um, 
But the thing that's amazing about these dogs is they can find, each dog is trained on up to 17,000 different odors. And that's a lot. Um, and that number is constantly growing because bad people who want to hurt other people are creating new chemical compounds that can hurt people. And so these dogs have to be constantly trained and retrained. So unlike other dogs who work in the military or the police, um, these dogs only do explosive detection. So while other dogs in the military and police might also find weapons or missing persons, um, or contraband, these dogs are only looking for explosives. Um, and again, going back to uh, a passive versus active alert, this dog, you can see how he's sitting patiently right here. So he's telling his handler, the bomb odor is here. It's not in these other tins, it's in this one. Now, a passive alert is really important in many cases, like explosives, because you don't want him doing an active alert, which is pawing, digging, biting. You definitely don't want that if you're dealing with bombs, right? That's probably a bad idea. So you also have to further train the dog to, yes, I found it, and be calm, which for some dogs is really hard. I know for my dog personally, sitting and being calm for anything is really hard. Um, so now we're getting into some other animals. And speaking of explosive detections, have you guys heard of explosive detection rats? These giant rats are trained to find um, uh, buried landmines after a bad war. And these rats are light enough that they can walk over the mine and say it's here without setting it off. So that's really helpful and useful. They're super trainable and they're not as expensive as a bomb detection dog. Um, and I know a lot of people don't like rats or mice, but I really like them. They're super smart, they're really trainable. And if you took my class last week, which is also recorded, um, you can learn how to train them to follow a stick and to make them spin in a circle. So they're super trainable and very kind. So while, oop, here we go, I started to lose my place here. So these rats have been trained in the Balkans, which is this area here. So if you guys are ever taking a, a ge uh, geography class, Here's Italy, and here's the Ukraine, and here's Turkey. So it's kind of that area with like Greece and Hungary and Romania. That area is called the Balkans, and these are where these rats are deployed to help detect landmines so people can either disarm them or, or clear the area so people who live in that area can be safe. And speaking of more landmine detection, these were my favorite, and I didn't know about these until earlier this week, the Croatian bomb bees. Isn't that cool? Like you can train bees to find explosives. Um, and they can detect landmines for up to three miles away. So let's think about it. Somerville, I think, is about four miles long. So if you deployed a bee on one end of Somerville, it could get almost all the way across the city and still find landmines, which is pretty incredible. Um, and the way they train these bees is actually pretty, pretty similar to how I train dogs in a sport called nose work or how we train the dogs uh, to find explosives. You mix something they really like. And in this case, it's sugar water. They love sugar water. Um, and you mix sugar water and you pair it with the odor of the landmine or explosives or whatever chemical you want them to find. Um, and then you start to take the sugar or water away. So they're only smelling the chemical, the bad chemical that goes boom. So when they find it, then we give them more sugar. You find this, now I'm gonna give you sugar for finding it. And that's how you build up this, this response. Oh, if I find this, then I get my sugar water. So. Um, kind of like when you guys go to the dentist, right? Or if you guys have to do something that you don't like. Well, if you do something you don't like, your parents might give you something you do. Um, it's kind of that idea. Um, and again, this is called pairing. So if you guys are interested in animal training, this concept is called pairing. You're pairing uh, something that doesn't mean anything with something super valuable, um, like a favorite toy or a snack. All right, so now let's talk about some animals who help people. And I think this is, when we think about animals who do work for us, this is what I think a lot of people uh, think about. But before we go into this section, there's going to be a few words that you might have heard before and some that you might not have that might be a little confusing. 
Um, and I'm just gonna move my recording here so that you can see all of it. So service animal, emotional support animal, and therapy dogs. Um, these, when I'm working as a dog trainer, I often will get um, clients or students who ask if I can help them train their emotional support animal to be calm and quiet so it can go places with them, like the grocery store. Or can you train my service animal to go into schools? Um, and in short, there, these three terms, service animal, emotional support animal, and therapy dogs, all mean something very different. Um, there are differences in where they can go, who can own them, and how they work. And so let's first talk about service animals, because when we talk about um, animals who help people, I think this is what most people, especially kids and adults who don't um, get to see animals doing super cool things, this might be the thing that you are most familiar with or that you might have thought about when you read the description for this course. Um, so service animals used to only be dogs until I think 2011. It's been very recent since we were also able to add miniature horses to the list of animals that can provide a service to a person who might need help getting around in the world. Um, but dogs are expensive to train and they have to be um, ready to do their job at a moment's notice, like maybe lead somebody who uh, is maybe going to have a seizure. That dog has to move somebody away from a stairwell. That could be a trained task that the service dog does to help a person stay safe. Um, or maybe help somebody who's blind, who can't see, navigate the streets of a city. Um, but because they're so expensive and they only work an average of seven years, um, we allowed little miniature horses. Look at his little sneakers. Did you see his little sneakers? So he can walk on floors safely. Um, so horses can help lead the blind. They can also um, help their owner get around. And also if you have a, a person with a disability that makes it hard for them to get around and they fall, they can lean on their horse and pull themselves up. And it's a lot safer than trying to do that on like a Labrador Retriever, which is a pretty big dog, but it can hurt the dog really badly. So the horses are a lot more sturdy and they can also work for up to 20 years. So you pay for the training once, but you have an animal that works a lot longer. These animals are trained to do a job for a human. Like I said before, it might be to detect an oncoming seizure and alert the owner. I have a friend and a colleague, another dog trainer friend of mine who uh, suffers from panic attacks. And so like, she'll start to do this and start to grab her hands and start to like, really start when she feels a panic attack coming and her dog is trained to break her hands apart so she doesn't get into that loop of, of uh, going into a, in an anxiety attack. So her dog is trained to do this job. And the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, this is a law and it says that animals can help people with disabilities or, um, or emotional uh, difficulty go out into the world and access public places. So like grocery stores, right? Your horse or your, uh, or your dog can help you get into the grocery store, maybe retrieve items you couldn't get before. Um, so this is all very, very good. And you don't see many mini horses doing this work, but you might. Um, but it's very important to realize that these animals, when you see this best assisting animal in training or uh, assistance animal, please don't touch. It's not because they, the owner doesn't want their animal to have a good time, it's because those animals are working really hard. So if you're a dog and you have to smell a chemical change in your human, that their insulin level is dropping and that they're going to pass out um, into diabetic shock, that animal is constantly working really, really hard to keep their owner safe. So walking up to that animal going, who's a good dog and patting it, making kissy faces, or why can't I pet your dog? Um, that's really, really, really hard on that animal. And it's really hard on that person who just wants to go to the grocery store or go for a walk with their pet um, who's working for them. So we cannot distract them, even if they're really, really cute. Um, but you can kind of, you know, like high five, good job animal and keep walking on and then talk to your parent or friend about how cool that was that you just saw that. Um, the next word you might have heard is an emotional support animal. And I often, 
in my line of work, hear these two phrases um, interchanged a lot, but they are not interchangeable. You can't replace emotional support animal with service animal. So emotional support animals are not trained animals. You cannot take that animal into a grocery store unless the person who owns the grocery store says, yes, you can bring in your emotional support animal or your pet dog. They cannot go anywhere that a pet dog would not otherwise be allowed to go. Um, they can go, um, you can get a note from a doctor to keep your emotional support animal, which has to be a domestic animal. So if you have a guinea pig and you were moving to an, an apartment and they wouldn't uh, let you, I, I see you raise your hand, I'll come in, back to you in a second. Let's say you have um, a guinea pig and you want to move to an apartment and that apartment complex says you're not allowed to have a guinea pig but you would be so severely emotionally distraught for having to say goodbye to your guinea pig um, that it could cause medical harm to you um, or somebody in your family, then, we would, um, then you would get a note and then that animal becomes your emotional support animal. Um, your medical provider can give you this note, um, but most apartment complexes and housing groups um, are getting away with their um, you can't have this animal in here anymore because animals are so important to people. Um, and again, this only applies to domestic animals. So if you hear that somebody has an emotional support cougar, they're lying. <laughs> no peacocks, no anything. Um, and they are also allowed um, on domestic flights. So they could fly as of right now, um, although I suspect that law will probably change. Um, they are also allowed to go and ride with you from say like, LaGuardia, New York to Wisconsin, but they're not allowed to go overseas or internationally with you as an emotional support animal. They cannot go from LaGuardia, New York to Italy. Um, so that is unless the airport or the airline says that it's okay. Um, so I will take questions at the end because I can't figure out how to stop sharing <laughs> my screen. So I'll take your question at the end, Agrada, but thank you so much for raising your hand. Keep that in mind. Um, and I will definitely answer that when we get to the end. Now contrast that with therapy dogs. And if you guys have seen, um, if you've gone to a library and in Somerville, we have Daisy, the reading dog. Um, these dogs are not like service dogs who work with a ham with their owner and help their owner. Therapy dogs help other people. And this is a big distinction between therapy dogs and, a, and emotional support dogs and service dogs. Um, they can help children in hospitals. They can help uh, in library reading hours, college kids um, getting study breaks um, and going into nursing homes. So if you see um, a therapy dog, that dog is going to work to help pe other people and then they get to go home with their owner. A certification is usually requested by the building or the uh, group that is uh, maybe working these dogs. So if I wanted to take my dog captain to work in a nursing home, the nursing home has certain requirements and maybe a specific certification that they would request. So then let's say they wanted me to work through Delta Dogs instead of Therapy Dogs International. So I would have to go to Delta Dogs, get him certified there so I can take him into the building. So it's a process. And some buildings don't have that. They're just like, sure, you got a cool dog, bring him in. So it, it's not regulated, um, but they're, there seems to be more of a need for these therapy dogs. Um, and not every dog can do this work, especially if the dog is super excited, right? So if you have a dog that's like boing, 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 or, or an animal like that, um, it, it would be mighty hard to bring that dog into like a hospital where there's equipment and uh, medicine and shiny floors, and they're supposed to be calm for a kid who may be really, really sick. So you have to make sure you have the right temperament for a dog to be able to do this kind of volunteer work. But then we have these other animals who help people. And I don't know if you guys have read the Good Night Stories for Rebel Girl series, but this girl, um, this girl is super cool and I really love her story. Um, her name is Asholpan Nergayev. And she, let me see if I can get these details correct. Um, she was a 13 year old Kazakh nomadic girl in Mongolia, and that's on the other side of the world. 
Um, and this is a pretty recent story. I want to say 2013 or 2015. So she's young like us. Well, like you guys, I'm not young. Um, but who knows why this might be an important job for an animal? Well, she uses this eagle to hunt, to help her family eat. But the other thing that's so fascinating about her is that she, like other Mongolian girls, are using their eagles to kind of break societal norms. So before she got a lot of attention, there have been other young girls who have gone on to do this, but generally a lot of the older men of the community think that girls shouldn't be able to do this, um, that they might be too weak to hold their eagle or that maybe they should be inside and cooking. Um, but these girls are saying, no, I wanna hunt and I'm good at it, so I'm gonna go do it. So not only um, did these men vocalize undue concern, uh, primarily in the community, the men who were judging the contest, um, there was like a contest that she entered with this eagle and she won at 13 years old. Um, and those men were actually quite supportive of her and, and wanted her to do well. Um, so while she wasn't the first eagle huntress, she is the most well-known. Um, and again, this animal not only hunts for food for her family, but is helping smash patriarchal assumptions and barriers while empowering young women all over the world. So I just, I love this eagle and her story. And if you haven't read the Goodnight Rebel Girls stories, you can, uh, you can listen to them on a podcast. There's a podcast about them and you can learn about all sorts of really cool people. Um, and there's also the books. I think there are three of them. So now we're gonna go on to animals that help in the environment. Um, and with climate change, the landscape is constantly changing. And with communities going dry, I'm sure you guys have studied climate change in school and that summers are getting hotter and winters are getting colder. Um, certain foliage and uh, forests and nature are not doing as well as they have been years ago. So grasses and bushes and plants all turn crisp and brown. Uh, the tiniest spark can set off a major fire. And this is what we saw um, in Australia earlier this year, where the entire continent had essentially been on fire. Um, and there are few weapons that we can use against the threat of massive forest fire. Um, in places where I grew up, I didn't grow up here in the city like many of you kids are. I grew up in a place called Maine. <laughs> it's very rural. There wasn't, um, we didn't even have a grocery store. We would have to drive um, across the state to get groceries or gas. Um, so we did what was called a prescribed burn. So in Maine, we have a lot of blueberry bushes. Um, as the blueberries get picked throughout the summer, um, all of the energy from that plant went into producing the fruit. And at the end of the year, you burn the blueberry fields because the root is still strong. The plant will come back. But if you let the plant get too big, all the energy goes into making the plant big instead of juicy into that fruit, that blueberry. So you burn it and it's a controlled burn. So you would maybe dig a trench around so that way the fire can't get out of control. You have the fire department on standby. You do what you can to make sure that this doesn't go out of control. Um, but when you have um, in places where it's dry, things can get out of hand really, really fast. Um, and you can't really get to these areas. You can't ferry in crews, you can't bring in equipment because the terrain is really hard. Um, you can't bring in a hand crew for two weeks with poison oak and get itchy and all of that bad stuff that's not fun. Um, and then they cut the stuff down. Maybe you can get chainsaws in there and you can break everything down, but then you just have dead and dying brush that can still catch fire because you can't get it out because you can't get equipment in. So what do you do and how do you help this problem? Well, you send in the goats. <laughs> goats eat everything and they're nimble and they can get places that people can't go. And so they can get where machines can't easily get. So when you send in these goats to, uh, to eat grass and bushes, poison ivy, poison oak, they can eat all those things that we can't touch. Um, they can eat dying foliage that is less fuel for the fire to be able to eat to get bigger and stronger. So instead of, uh, instead of having a massive fire, you might just have a small fire that you can control and take care of. Um, you, control the fuel, you control the fuel source, you control the burn. And these goats are happy to eat whatever is in front of them. It is a win-win. 
Look at how cute he is. He's awesome. This one's my favorite. When I did um uh I did a <laughs> I did a version of this for the Museum of Science um a few months ago before everything shut down about how cool dogs are. And this was my favorite dog. Uh, this is Tucker. He's a conservation canine. So if you pay attention, if you come in next week's talk where I talk about things you can do, uh, if you like science and you like dogs, this is maybe one way that you can work in both populations. Uh, this is Tucker, this black lab right here. He is a conservation canine, a CK9 for short, if you're looking is this up on Google later. Um, and he is trained to find whale poop. Ew, why would he want to find whale poop? Um, well, researchers in Washington state that's on the other side of the country from us, were noticing that, um, that whale babies that were, uh, whales that were pregnant were miscarrying. And that means that like the pregnant whales were losing the babies before they were born. The babies weren't born alive. And so they were trying to figure out why so many whales were dying. So they decided they needed to study these whales and what better way to study them than grabbing their poop. But whales are huge and they're big and their poop, as soon as they poop, sinks. So these dogs were trained to find whale scat or poop or poo or doo-doo or whatever you wanna call it. Um, these dogs can find that odor. So as it's sinking, remember they can smell up to 40 feet under your feet and they can smell 13 parts per trillion, three drops inside of a four Olympic swimming pools. They can find where these whale pod poops are. Um, so Tucker, who has since retired, um, in this photo from the Smithsonian here, he is leading researchers to where the whale scat is located under the surface. Um, but here's the funniest thing about Tucker, and this is why I love this story so much. Dogs like Tucker, he's a Labrador retriever, and these dogs are known for loving water and being around water and swimming and all of that fun stuff. They were bred to like retrieve ducks that people had shot out of the sky to help hunters bring in ducks and water game. So water shouldn't be that hard for Tucker, but Tucker's aquaphobic. And aquaphobic is a fancy word for I'm afraid of water. So you have a Labrador retriever who's afraid of water, who's working on the water to help scientists and, and marine researchers. And this dog was happy to do it as long as he didn't have to go in. So he would lean over the boat and point with his nose where the whale scout was. So this, I just love this story and Tucker's tenacity. And speaking of really cool tenacious dogs, we have Bear. And so remember at the beginning of this year, we had these big Australian wildfires. I guess they didn't bring the goats in soon enough. Uh, but Bear is a dog who risked his life to help save koalas. It's an endangered species. So as the fires were burning more and more out of control, the risk of losing these animals, these, these awesome marsupials that are only found in Australia was, was becoming difficult um, and really scary that we might lose this species forever. So during the last bout of devastating forest fires, it's believed that many of the habitats will never recover from these fires earlier this year. The fires were that bad and that intense and thanks to climate change. Um, so a half a billion animals lost their lives. That's a lot of animals. Um, but thanks to dogs like Bear, many were rescued in time. So the University of Sunshine Coast Detection Dogs for Conservation, so he's another conservation canine like Tucker the Whale Scat detective, um, was able to sniff out sick, orphaned, and injured koalas across New South Wales and Queensland, Australia. He was trained and he works in partnership with the International Fund for Animal Welfare. He was purchased as a puppy from a pet store. So if you ever want to talk to me about how to find a dog to maybe bring into your home appropriately, going to a pet store is not the way to do it. Um, so the a family purchased him from a pet store and then they said, oh, he's too high energy. We don't want him anymore. So they sent him to a shelter. Um, and so when he was there, um, let's see, he was too much for them. He was too energetic, too wild, too crazy, and they just didn't want to deal with him anymore. So in came these researchers who found this puppy who was too high energy for family life, but was perfect for this kind of work. Bear also doesn't seem he is high energy and he doesn't like to be touched. 
He doesn't like to really work with people and get affection in the same way that we tend to think of dogs. Like you touch them, you pat them, you play ball, you play chase. He wants none of that. His job, um, what made him so special and flunk out of living with people is what made his job so very critical for him to be able to survive and do something really cool and for um, other families to find maybe a more appropriate house pet. So for him, his only mission, his motive is to go out there and find these, these baby koalas. So he was able to detect these koalas. He also has zero prey drive. And what that means is he doesn't want to chase them to hurt them. He doesn't want to, if you've seen some dogs that chase rabbits or squirrels or birds, he doesn't have that prey drive. He just wants to find them and then get snacks and then go find the next one. Very much in the same way that we've trained those bombies to find um, explosives and get sugar water or where Captain finds birch oil and he gets cookies. Um, because they can smell what we cannot see, dogs can be used to track rare animals, detect pests species, so like uh, beetles or invasive species, dogs can find them and then we can take care of it um, and locate threatened native plants so they have an important role to play in conservation. So here are the resources for today. Oh, I'm gonna let her in here. So the resources for today, we have Daisy, the cancer detection dog. If you want these, I can take a picture of this or I can send this video to Heather and she can get it to you guys. I'll also pop it up on YouTube so you guys should be able to find it. But these were all the dogs and rats and bombies and eagles and super cool animals that we got to talk about today, especially the eating goat one. So let me stop this here. I'm gonna stop my recording. I'm gonna stop my screen share. Uh, which one first? I think I'm gonna stop my share and then I'm gonna stop my recording.